So, if you've clicked on this video, you may be wondering what the title means, how stories are told. What do you mean how stories are told? Stories are told with once upon a time and follow all the way through to the end. What I mean, rather, is how stories are told through different mediums. While I mostly analyze and discuss and review books on this channel, I'm really just a fan of the art of storytelling in general. And so what I thought I would do here today is try to broaden my scope, if you will, and explore the art of storytelling through different mediums and rather how different mediums approach the art of storytelling. I have selected four storytelling mediums to explore. I have excluded um, the oral tradition um, because I don't really think that's all that relevant anymore. And I think the only examples of oral storytelling that we probably have in the modern world is like audiobooks and radio plays. And I'm just going to exclude that. So the four storytelling mediums that I have selected to explore are lexical print, meaning novels, poems, plays, and such, anything involving printed words, comics, film, and video games. These are the four main mediums of storytelling as I see them in our modern world today. And I have selected an example of each one of these four things in total, which I believe exemplify how that particular medium can tell a story in a way that is superior to other mediums or perhaps would be impossible in any other medium besides the one in question. So let's start out with lexical print and I will show the example I have chosen and expound upon why I have selected it. Now the work which I have selected to represent lexical print is a novel entitled Company of Liars by Karen Maitland. This is a historical novel set during the Black Death in medieval Europe and it follows a group of nine strangers who are brought together by chance, all of whom possess a secret. Now this work is told in the first person that is very important because there is a twist at the end, a pretty great twist, which can only be done in a specific way. So these nine characters, and by the way, I'm going to spoil this book. If you want to read this book, if you've heard of it and you would like to read it yourself, I'm about to spoil it, so be warned. As these nine characters journey across medieval Europe, they encounter a series of scenarios in which women are mistreated. Now, I'm not trying to say that this book is like some kind of feminist novel or that it's trying to make any kind of a statement. Rather, it just kind of has a, a subtle commentary on the way that women were viewed and often mistreated in medieval Europe. Because if you didn't know, women in medieval Europe did not really have it in the greatest. But as these nine people travel across plague-ravaged Europe, um, trying to stay ahead of the disease, they witness the mistreatment and prejudices against women endemic to that time period. Now, the twist that comes at the end of this book is that the main character, the narrator of the book, who, whom we have assumed by default up until this point was a man, is actually a woman. And this is, A, a really good twist, a really neat twist, I think, but B, something that could only have been done in this medium, I, I believe. You see, the work is withholding information from you up until the very end of the book, but you don't realize that it is, and that is the trick. I do not believe that this twist could have been pulled off in a film or any other medium, or at least not as well as in a novel, because you are not aware that you're not getting the full picture until the book actually gives you the full picture and then you get it. You understand that you've been duped, you've been hoodwinked, you've been bamboozled. The narr since the book is told in first person, the narrator only ever refers to themselves as I. I said this, I did this. Uh, I don't even believe we get, it's been a while since I read it, but I don't even believe we get the character's name until the end of the book. 
they're just a wandering herbalist kind of person who, who we just assume kind of because of our own inherent prejudices that we might not even be aware of until we read the book is a man. But it turns out at the end it was actually a woman all along. Uh, and this is just, again, a twist I think they could only have been pulled off in the medium in which it was created. And so, therefore, I have chosen this to represent lexical print and exemplify something which I believe only it could do. Now, the next storytelling medium which I have selected for exploration is comics. Now, comics is something of an oddity because it is a hybrid of both the printed and visual medium. And it's a relatively new medium, only really beginning, I suppose, less than a hundred years ago in the form that we think of it today, you know, like DC and Marvel Comics. Now, that is not at all to say that it, does, it is without merits as a lot of people have kind of written it off and don't really give it as much credence as I think they probably should, but hopefully I can change that because I have selected a work which I believe really embodies something that only comics can do, which could not be done in a novel or perhaps even in a film. So let's take a look. So the work which I have chosen to represent comics is possibly my favorite comic, Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. This is regarded as one of the big two, alongside Alan Morris and Dave Gibbons' Watchmen, which also came out like The Dark Knight Returns in 1986. These two works are pointed at as having revolutionized the comics medium, although perhaps not for the reason why a lot of people think. A lot of people think that Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns changed the game because they were dark and gritty and violent and they weren't really aimed at children. And that's partly why, but it doesn't really capture the full picture. The real reason why Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns changed the game for comics is because they demonstrated that comics could tell a story in a manner that is unique to that medium, which I'm going to demonstrate here. Now, I'm not gonna recap the full story of this um, for the sake of brevity. However, the scenes which I'm going to display happen in the final, or close to, it concerns the final confrontation between Batman and his arch nemesis, the Joker. Now, now a lot of people r remember this scene for whenever Batman snaps the Joker's neck and then the Joker finishes breaking his own neck and kills himself, or at least that's what a lot of people think happens. But what actually happens is that Batman just straight up kills the Joker. And a lot of people don't think that happens in this comic, and they will argue with you if you say, if you assert that that is what happens, but it is what happens, and I'm going to prove why. And so let's take a look at some scenes, some panels from Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, and I'll it, I'll illustrate how he uses the artwork to subtly alter the meaning of the events depicted. So in this scene here is the panel which uh, depicts the Joker on the talk show. Um, I'm not going to read all the dialogue or stuff, but I want to point out to the green boxes in the bottom right where he says so many faces so different from one another so few smiles this is his internal monologue because frank miller really really loves that internal narration where he allows the characters to narrate the story in a manner reminiscent of like raymond chandler it's, he miller was a big fan of like film noir and everything kind of pulp stories and so he really puts that to use in these comics. Now I want to I want to highlight the colors which he uses here. The Joker's uh, internal monologue is painted in green, matching his hair. Let's take a look at another scene, however. So in the same um, in the same scene, sorry, I meant to say, take a look at a different panel. In the same scene, the Joker says, I'm going to kill everyone in this room. Now, it's important to note how the speech bubble is drawn and also how the speech bubble of 
the talk show host that says, now that's darn rude, is written. They're written identically. That is just a white speech bubble with black text. Now, keep that in mind as we go on to the next scene. So this is the scene where Batman snaps the Joker's neck. And now the, the dialogue, or it's not dialogue, but the text here is Batman's internal narration. It's his monologue that's happening inside his head where he says, the roar is fading, I hear voices as he's breaking the dude's neck. Now, note the color of Batman's internal monologue. It is written in a dark gray to match Batman's color scheme of his costume, which is black and gray. Now, keep that in mind as we go on a panel. So, after he partially, or we think partially, snaps the Joker's neck, the Joker says, just an ounce or two more of pressure, and do I hear sirens? Yes, coming close. You won't get far. But it doesn't matter if you do. They'll kill you for this, and they'll never know that you didn't have the nerve. I'll see you in hell. And then it says, with the devil's strength, he twists and twists what's left of his spine goes, and then he just finishes breaking his neck. Now, this is where it gets tricky, and uh, this is the part that a lot of people don't really understand, because they think that this is just a clear-cut you know, depiction of events when it is not. Now, the Joker's speech bubbles are colored now to match the color of Batman's internal narration. Look at the top right panel where he says, I'll see you in hell, and then Batman narrates with the devil's strength he twists. Now, those two bubbles are virtually indistinguishable, and that's the point. It's subtly implied that he actually did kill him the first time in the previous panel when he broke his neck, and that all this is simply happening inside his mind because he can't come to grips with the fact that he just killed somebody because, you know, Batman doesn't typically kill. And so what Miller does in this scene is absolutely masterful because he completely, he gives us two separate depiction of events when we only think we're getting one because so many people read this and they just say oh he's he just you know broke his own neck and he killed himself that's not really what happens batman absolutely does kill him he breaks his neck completely the first time and everything subsequent to that happens in his own mind because the speech bubbles are of the joker are now colored identically to batman's internal monologue speech bubbles. This is a twist that only comics could do. And this is why The Dark Knight Returns is as highly regarded as it is because it demonstrated an edge that comics have that other mediums don't. Again, you I don't think you could do this in a film or at least not as elegantly as it does it here. And I don't think you could do it in a book or a novel. Uh, with, um, I mean, novels and stuff do have, you know, unreliable narrators, but this is something that you don't even, that so many people don't even understand the first time they read it, because this is something that comics, this is a thing that comics has that it can do better than any other medium. And so for that reason, I have selected The Dark Knight Returns to exemplify something an aspect of storytelling that only comics can do, or at least do this well. So the next medium of storytelling, which I would like to explore is film. And the movie which I have selected to represent that is Joker, the recent film directed by Todd Phillips. Now that's kind of sensing a theme coming off of the comics, um, example, which was also involved the character of the Joker. And uh, funnily enough, I actually made a video critiquing Todd Phillips' Joker in which I examined that film with a rather critical eye. However, my qualms with that film had nothing to do with the actual filmmaking aspects of it, which were largely without flaw. And Joker did something very interesting and which I really think demonstrates uh, an aspect of storytelling which film can do 
far superior to any other medium. And I will show that with this next scene. So watch this scene from the movie Joker, and then I will explain its significance. We went over this penny. You adopted him. We have all the paperwork right here. That's not true. Thomas had that all made up. So it stayed our secret. You also stood by when one of your boyfriends repeatedly abused your adopted son and battered you. <laughs> Penny, your son was found tied to a radiator in your filthy apartment, malnourished with multiple bruises across his body and severe trauma to his head. I never heard him cry. He's always been such a happy little boy. <laughs> this scene is not really happening. What's happening is that he is reading a report of events which happened long in the past. But what we are presented with is a representation of these events as constructed by his mind. And what it does is create a far more dynamic spectacle than what we would get if this occurred in a book or, you know, it's anything like that. What this, what film is able to do is take something which would be nominally rather uneventful and even boring otherwise and turn it into something dynamic and engaging. It More than that, though, it merges the events of the past and the present by inserting him into the scene, which he was not actually in, to illustrate how the past influences the present. You see, this is a trick that only filmmaking, I think, can do, or again, can only do this well, because if this was written in, say, a novel, uh, it would be rather boring. It would just be him reading a report and having an emotional reaction to it. But the way the film presents it, it is a scene unto itself. It is actual moving pictures. It is an actual representation of dynamic events of which he becomes a part. And that is why this scene, I believe, really illustrates how Film can approach storytelling in a way that can do things that that uh, novels or comics or any other medium really can't. This is very interesting to watch, and it keeps us engaged, even though by rights nothing really engaging is happening. We don't really notice that because it's giving us something to engage with. And so, once again, this is a trick I think only film can pull off. The fourth and final medium of storytelling which I would like to discuss today is video games. Video games are without question the youngest medium of storytelling which we have today and one which is still kind of proving itself. I think video games are kind of where comics used to be. They aren't really taken that seriously um, by a lot of people. And they're often kind of written off as just mere entertainment incapable of making any serious artistic statements. I think that's definitely untrue, but for the purposes of this video, I would like to select one video game which I think exemplifies how the farm can tell stories uniquely, and that game is Dark Souls by From Software. I've never played Dark Souls myself because I'm not that good of a gamer, 
and I don't really play games that much anymore. But Dark Souls tells a unique story, and it tells it in a unique fashion. And I would like to touch upon that and kind of explore that and see how it tells its story in a way that only a video game can tell a story. Perhaps the greatest thing which a video game can offer a player that a book cannot offer a reader and a film cannot offer a viewer is the ability of choice, as well as a vastly enhanced measure of participation. Video games are the most participatory art form in existence today. They require a much more active engagement on the part of the player to even make the story happen at all. The narrative of Dark Souls is highly minimalist in nature. The game puts the player in the shoes of an avatar of their own design and then places them in a game which they can approach from a ver variety of ways. The story is not directly told, but rather indirectly told. It's there, but it's in the background, and it's up to the player to discover the story as they go. And depending on what choices the player makes along the way, the ultimate resolution of the game's story may differ wildly in outcome. This is a form of storytelling that is unique to video games. There are such things as choose-your-own-adventure books which attempt to recreate this kind of choice and payoff system. However, those pale in comparison to the level of control which video games can extend to players. I would also like to point out that Dark Souls is a fantasy game, and I will make the assertion here and now that video games are actually the optimum medium for fantasy storytelling because they can integrate lore and world building in a way that doesn't rely on the clunky exposition that so often plagues fantasy novels. But Dark Souls is just one example of video game storytelling and really isn't even the most extreme example. After all, games like Minecraft have no inherent narrative at all other than that which the player creates themselves. Again, this is a form of storytelling which no other medium besides video games can execute. And I personally think that as video games evolve as an art form and become more serious and take themselves more seriously as a viable medium of artistic expression, that this system of choice and consequence will be expanded and become far more critically relevant and genuinely renowned than it is today. So I hope you have enjoyed this video and exploration of the art of storytelling as approached by different mediums because different mediums by necessity have to approach storytelling from different angles. And even though literature is my main forte on this channel, really I'm just a fan of the art of storytelling in general. And so I just wanted to make this video, as I said, to kind of broaden my scope a bit, but also just to appreciate how stories are told across different forms because different formats have different advantages and disadvantages and I just kind of wanted to, you know, do something that touches upon that and, you know, kind of explores the differences in how stories are told via different mediums. And again, I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you have, you know, perhaps seen something you haven't seen or realized something you haven't realized. And as always, if you have enjoyed anything you've seen or heard here today, remember to like, subscribe, help the channel out a little bit, and until next time, peace.